Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So for all of you who don't know me yet, my name is Mark and I'll be your host on Beasts in the City. Today our main discussion is about food itself and 5 things that we never actually learned or had the time to look at in our daily routine. First I'll take a few seconds to let you know that I'm also uploading workout videos so you can check out my fully explained upper body pull workout whenever you're done with this video. Now let's go through the 5 things that you need to know about food. Number 5 and the most common is that food contains macronutrients such as fats, carbs and proteins that act as fuel for our system to help keep us alive and going. And that's it. Easy, right? No. See, that's partly true, but there's more to it. Human bodies are not machines or combustion engines waiting to burn whatever you fuel them with. They're complex, highly sensitive, self-regulating, incredible systems. While machines have precise inputs and outputs, like when you recharge your phone's battery life or when you fill up a car's gas tank, you'll know more or less how far it's gonna drive. But if you spend time calculating calories for a human body's daily consumption, you'll know that it can be frustrating and nearly impossible. Research now shows that all food isn't created equal, and what we eat isn't necessarily what we absorb, and there are hundreds of factors that can affect how we digest, process, and utilize the food we eat. This means that the calorie value of food outside the human body isn't necessarily the same as the value inside it. So there's more to food than acting as chemical bonds that generate energy, aka ATP, when broken down. Food also contains micronutrients, which brings us down to number 4. Food brings us vitamins, minerals, and compounds such as phytochemicals, which are nutrients found in plants, and zoochemicals, which on the other hand, come from animals. While none of these nutrients provide direct fuel, we still need them to have an overall healthier organism, but we need much less of them than fats, carbs, and proteins, and this is why they're called micronutrients. You can easily get some vitamins from plant and animal foods, such as vitamin B6 can be found in potatoes or sweet potatoes, as well as in fish, pork, beef, and poultry, or also get some minerals such as chromium from both plant and animal sources which can be found in broccoli, oats, and beef as well. The list goes on, but there are few micronutrients such as vitamin B12 that can only be found in animal food sources such as fish and beef. Now on one end of the list, phytonutrients and their cousins mycronutrients which are found in fungi such as mushrooms play a role in influencing hormonal function, helping with DNA repair, fighting bacteria and viruses, lowering inflammation, and acting as antioxidants. While on the other end of our micronutrients list are the zoonutrients that play many roles in our organisms and some of them include supporting healthy brain function, helping us build stronger muscles, and preventing glycation of our blood cells. Without these compounds, our bodies break down and we wouldn't be able to function properly. So if you don't get enough of them, or contrarily get too much of them, we may get sick or disrupt some key processes in our system that could mislead our brain into sending the wrong information out to our organism. And here we are with what led us to number 3. Food is in part information. When we eat, we're partly giving information that will end up as messages being transferred inside our body, represented as instructions that kick off a chemical chain level. To put this simply, when you eat, you're basically telling your body to release a hormone to hold another one, to express a protein or to trigger immune cells, and the list goes on and on. Let's ask ourselves, what kind of role do vitamins and minerals play in immune function and metabolism? What would happen if you had a deficiency in one of these nutrients, or if you had an excess? And how would your body process these nutrients if you were, let's say, happy, angry, Maybe in a rush or anxious. A generally approached answer to that lies in number two, where feelings can actually affect the way we process and digest the food that we eat. 
In fact, one newsletter from the Harvard Medical School published that when a person becomes stressed enough to trigger the fight or flight response, for example, digestion slows or even stops so that the body can divert all its internal energy to facing a perceived threat. In response to less severe stress, such as public speaking, the digestive process may slow or be temporarily disrupted, causing abdominal pain and other symptoms of functional gastrointestinal disorders. And in another newsletter they published that the brain has a direct effect on the stomach and intestines. For example, the very thought of eating can release the stomach's juices before food gets there. This connection goes both ways. A troubled intestine can send signals to the brain, just as a troubled brain can send signals to the gut. Therefore, a person's stomach or intestinal distress can be the cause or the product of anxiety, stress, or depression. This is true in cases where a person experiences an upset stomach with no obvious physical cause. Those are only two examples of how our digestion process can be affected by our own emotions. Hundreds of causes that influence nutrient processing exist and not all of them are a disadvantage. Don't forget, a happy mind is a happy stomach. Finally, and most importantly, number one. Food labels are not always accurate. That's true, and studies have proven it a long time ago. The information you see on the back of a food label that tells you how many calories are there of each macro and micronutrient inside the selected item are actually previously measured inside a device called the bomb calorie meter that estimates their caloric value through a very simple process. Although this may seem scientific, it's only an approximation, and many factors can affect that information, such as length of storage if it's a canned product, or the animal's diet if it's dairy, meat, chicken, and eggs, or it can even be the soil and growing conditions of the plants being grown before they were harvested. So not every can, not every bag, and not every pre-packed meal has the same caloric values as the other just like it's stated on their identical labels and they can differ slightly and sometimes significantly. Here's a study published by the Obesity Society in 2012. Its goal was to investigate label accuracy of popular energy-dense snack foods and pre-packed foods to see if they would find any differences in their values. After conducting the investigation, they discussed that measured energy values exceeded label statements by 8% on average in pre-packed convenience meals, which is slightly higher but consistent with the label disparity of 4.3% in packaged snack foods. Those results were analyzed using a bomb calorie meter, which also implies that different analysis can often prove different results, and that some analytical methods can often be imprecise. What I mean to say by all this is that you don't need to spend your time and energy trying to calculate the exact amount of food that you should be consuming, because it can be frustrating and it's not as accurate as you think. The best way to do this is to work on portion control. And whenever it comes to calculating numbers, you don't need to be 100% precise. Just give or take based on the portion size that you started with. So guys, I hope you learned something new from this informative video. Let me know in the comments below. Leave me a thumbs up, subscribe for more, and I'll see you all in the next video.